Apart from being an incredible strategist, a marvelous intuitive both politician and strategist, and was merciless. And yet there was something about him that fascinated me in that how could a man like this, who's on his way to take Moscow, to take Russia, be obsessed with what his his wife is doing back in Paris. She was such a sort of independent force for herself that slowly became extinguished by her relationship to this emperor who was a dictator and dominated both her and other countries and killed so many people. And I think her flame was kind of extinguished throughout. So it was a very complex, quite hard journey to play of somebody that had this kind of wild energy that was not had no permission whatsoever to be who she was. At the time, I thought, God, there must be so many women in history who have had that kind of capacity, capability, fire, and not really been allowed ever to, to have the space to express it. Hey, Marco. Charlie Mark. Yeah, Ridley, you've heard it time and time again, I'm sure, but he hand draws every scene. He shoots the movie in his head, and he does that almost fanatically, and you see him in any down moment. It's not a job to him, it's him creating art. We have an 800 person crew, anywhere from four to 11 or 12 cameras. And so working with a filmmaker that has a vision that's that clear, it makes it easier for Mark and I to function and provide what Ridley needs uh, for him uh, by seeing this blueprint and then, you know, um, executing it. You do, um, for instance, Waterloo, was uh, seven days. And then you got the visual effects. It's because I never had more than 100 horses in the field. On those big days, I'd have 300 men. But what you see finally is 20,000 horses. And so that's organization, but it means everyone's blood is up and you, there's marvelous bits you get because you're actually reconstructing the real thing. <laughs> We built our own cannons. We were building a foundry to build uh, custom cannons, which is part of the storytelling, which I won't go into. But um, I think if you read the history of Napoleon, his rise to fame was due to his uh, artillery sort of skills and prowess and the cleverness of his tactics. And we're trying to show that. Uh, the politics of the era We've recreated the uh, Jacobin Club. We've recreated the Congress of Vienna. We've recreated the uh, Guillotine Square. Chopped off a few heads, of course. And so there's a, a, an enormous amount of pageantry to do with the revolution in this. It's a great big canvas. This is a, a major task to be able to pull off all of these looks the, the right period, making the actors comfortable to be able to work within them, the dresses, you know, and the, the looks for Vanessa, the royal military looks for Joaquin. You see all these soldiers walking these fields, running in these fields, battling each other on horseback. All of them have to have their costumes look right. They have to be aged, they have to be um, of the right you know, battle, different colors, of course, for different armies. And it's a Herculean task they've been able to pull off to keep it all straight and, and make it look so great. There were victims' balls all over Paris after the um, revolution just basically released all the prisoners and those who had survived the guillotine went completely mad when everybody was just completely really sapphic and we've done a lot of see-through mesh dresses which reveal most of the women um, and a very low cut and the maddest hats i've had so much fun with the hats big flowers big straw coming up here 
big feathers. And I mean, it's been documented quite um, liberally that this is how the women dressed. And the men were dandies beyond dandies with much longer pointed shoes, skinnier trousers, stripy, big stripy jackets. They were, they were in big hats. They were really quite extreme. Everything has become so architecturally preserved, not only here, but around the world. It's difficult to go absolutely wild in um, historical places anymore. And, you know, and I think that's a good thing. So we decided to build the sets, but we modeled it on um, some of the local architecture, which is Napoleonic. And we made impressions of the stone walls um, to use existing buildings around us, adjacent buildings, so it would match, and architectural features um, incorporated into the set to uh, be able to extend the environment using both existing fortress and the built set parts. Action. We decided he was a Corsican thug because he was a, a middle-class Corsican who, they didn't have much money. We came up upon that in talking incessantly about who and what he might be, because Joaquin was trying to focus on, yeah, but how does he walk? How does he think? How does he sit? We just kept looking at portraits, and the portraits are fantastic. And you can stare at the, the image, stare at the man, knowing an ego has come into play. He's not handsome. He's never been able to attract women until he saw this woman, laid eyes on this woman, and something happened. You see him as a manipulator, as a rascal, as a, you know, um, somebody who's got a devious sense of humor in, in Napoleon. And then you see a dictator who's relentless, who's violent, ruthless, will stop at nothing for control. And then you see a guy who's intoxicated by his wife, and he's so in love with her. He's so smitten by her, but he can't control her. Of all the things he can conquer, he can't conquer his wife. And so he plays all these different things, and he plays them through the same character and same lens, and that's really extraordinary. Joaquin was just so incredible at the kind of idiosyncratic, um, yeah, psychological portrait of a war criminal um, who had the mind of somebody who wanted to carry out the things that he wanted to. It was really amazing to watch him go into something and like not be afraid to touch the really dark places and the disturbing places and and then, you know, come off set and we'd have a laugh and have loads of fun. So yeah, it was really it was really incredible to watch. What I admire about Joaquim is that he comes in before everybody else. When we come in early, before crew call even um, to absorb the ambience of the, of the sets and the locations and just get in the feel of things. And he walked into this one set and he just simply said, amazing. That was his comment. And then sat down and started studying his lines. So that was very, you know, encouraging, I'd say. Napoleon, um, Joachim, is very much as per every portrait you've ever seen. He never wore or very, very rarely wore civilian clothes. He wore infantry, which is the Navy, and chasseurs a cheval, the green. And he wore one or the other most of the time of his entire life. So you would think, well, that's quite easy, but it's never that easy. Uh, Joachim is vegan. So the hats were made out of bark skin and his boots and gloves were made of fake su suede. The beginning of the journey was reading everything I possibly could about Josephine. I locked myself away and just read every book I could about her and him. Uh, we went to Paris and went to the Napoleon Museum. We went to Malmaison. We went to, I went to see Josephine's tomb. It was such a privilege to learn about her. She was iconic um, and I felt, yeah, really honored to kind of try and inhabit her, especially because Compared to Napoleon, so much of her history and her story 
hasn't been illuminated, so it felt like an opportunity to do that. I think Vanessa's got this thing of taking all that information and somehow glowing, and there she is. Um, and she does it with such confidence and sensuality, but, and what's great is humor. She's got a great sense of humor and a very natural, intuitive sense of timing. When Vanessa came along, we stuck with the same silver gold. You know, once she was on her way up and she clocked Napoleon, we basically went from much simpler gowns to much more ornate, a lot more jewelry, etc. He's completely embracing everything that she is. His letters for her are comically rude and juvenile and over-romantic and even quite dirty. So there's many letters to Josephine where he absolutely was enchanted by her. It is the, the story of so many women and, um, yeah, I had so much compassion for her by the end because she wasn't really allowed to have a voice, even though she was incredibly strong, potent energy. The empress that she she had to be was very much the one that Napoleon needed her to be, and so that's how she had to adapt. So it was like a life of adaptation, really. Um, and she, I think she did so well surviving it, honestly, because it was a brutal time. In a funny kind of way, all films, hopefully, are kind of relevant. I think our influence as filmmakers is scary because the influence can be great or it can be deadly. Whose country are we in? 